So welcome to uh, lecture two, uh, segment one, and this is about uh, principal stresses and principal axes. What we did last time was we uh, considered uh, a little elemental cube that we put an imaginary cut in on an inclined plane, which is this one marked in red. And then we found out what the stress normal and along that plane would have to be, sigma and tau, in order to keep it in equilibrium. We found that it was these two equations, 6 and 8. And we then messed with those to get equations 9 and 10. And we looked at graphing those out in figure 9 of the notes, uh, which uh, um, we said that those would have uh, a, a minimum or maxima in them in interesting places. So the interesting thing is there's always going to be an angle we can pick where tau disappears. That's interesting. So let's find out what that is. So if we take equation 10 and we make tau 0, we can see if we can make it happen. So if we make tau 0, if we bring this over to the left-hand side, we'll have a half sigma x minus sigma y times sine 2 theta will be equal to tau xy cos 2 theta when tau is 0. How so? Now, if I divide that down, I'll have a tan 2 theta sine over cos. So I can make that tan 2 theta. So when tau xy is equal to tan 2 theta sigma x minus sigma y to half, I'll have a condition where tau would be 0. And in fact, I can then find tan 2 theta by dividing this back down here, sigma x minus sigma y a half the difference between them. So that's equation 11. So when we're at this particular special angle, the shear stress on the inclined plane will be zero. So effectively, we'll have rotated the stress tensor. If we rotate it by an angle theta, then the shear stress, this shear stress here, will disappear and we'll have an, uh, a, a set of axes where there are no shears at all. So we can always make a stress matrix into one, or stress tensor, into one where there's no shear at all if we're allowed to rotate the axes. So that's, that's quite, quite interesting, quite surprising. And uh, if we're uh, allowed to have... Um, uh, tan is periodic with a period of pi. So tan 2 theta is periodic with a, a, a period of pi by 2. So the value of theta that that corresponds to is equal to a half arc tan, so tan to the minus 1, tor xy over a half sigma x minus sigma y plus n pi by 2, n being some number, some integer number uh, united with naught. So uh, you can have that angle, that angle plus 90 degrees, that angle plus 180, that angle plus 270. So that is, if you imagine we've rotated to our new set of axes, if you've got that one being the right one, you've also got this one, this one, this one, that's plus 90, 180, and plus 270, if you like. So 90 and 180. So you've got a new set of axes. So you really will have disappeared the shear stress. There won't be on any of the planes. The stress tensor must be symmetric, so that's sort of obviously true as well. Um, so we call these new axes principal axes. And they're the ones where the shear stress disappears. And we call the corresponding stresses, the corresponding normal stresses, we call those... Uh, sigma 1 and sigma 2, and we call them the principal stresses um, correspondingly. And these are then the subject, really, of this, of this little section. Um, and it's always possible to do that, and it's a consequence of the tensor being a square symmetric tensor. Um, you can always find what it turns out are its eigenvalues. It's always diagonalizable as a matrix if it's a real symmetric tensor. And that, that's pr provable. In, in my undergraduate degree, we had to prove it. So um, 
the next thing to do is to find what the values of those principal stresses are. Now you could do it by finding this angle and putting it back into equation 9. But you can't write that down anal analytically. So actually we're going to do it another way, which is a bit cleverer, um, which will take us a, a little bit of mathematical manipulation, but we'll get there. Okay? So I'm just going to wipe this off the board and then we'll carry on. Now to find the principal stresses, sorry, sorry. Now to find the principal stresses, what we're going to do is we're going to consider the special case where tor is equal to zero. And in that special case, we can now generate uh, a couple of simultaneous equations. Um, and what we're going to do, instead of resolving parallel to sigma and parallel to tor, what we'll do is we'll resolve parallel to x and parallel to y, and therefore this will allow us to find uh, values of theta, and it'll all work out. So, trust me. Um, so let's uh, resolve forces in the x direction. So we'll resolve in x. Now, if we resolve in x... Actually, in some ways, it's simpler, right? Because we don't have to consider all four of these. We just have to consider that guy, that guy. So we've got, uh, going to the left, we've got sigma x times c cos theta. Um, going to the left, we've also got a tor xy times the area it's acting on, which is c sine theta. And going to the right, we've got sigma resolved down by an angle theta. So if this is theta, uh, this is 90 minus theta, that's theta again. So we've got sigma, the area it's acting on is C, and resolving it into the x direction we get a cos theta. Um, and therefore we can then cancel the C's, that's very nice, um, and we've got an expression for sigma. Um, now we still haven't found theta, but so we need to do this again and we resolve forces in the y direction. Now in the y direction we'll have a sigma y times c sine theta. We'll have a tor xy going down again, that's times c cos theta. And we'll have sigma now resolved up, so that angle must be 90 minus theta if that one was theta. So we'll have a sigma times the area it's acting on C times sine theta. Again, we'll be able to cancel the C's. Off they go. Um, so that's very nice. Um, and so we've got a, an expression for those. Now um, let let's do something. Let's let's do something with some angles. Um, so that's uh, equation 15 if you're following notes, and that's equation uh, 17. Now, let's uh, make a tan theta. So let's take equation 15, divide by cos, and rearrange. So we'll have a tor xy times tan theta, if we divide it all through by cos, is equal to, we'll collect the sigma and the sigma x, sigma minus sigma x, and the cos theta is divided through, so it's gone. So that's quite neat. That's equation 16. Let's do the same sort of trick to equation 17. So we want to make a tor xy. Let's divide it all through by sine this time. So we'll have a tor xy cot theta. Divide it all through by sine. And let's collect over the sine theta term. So we'll have a sigma minus sigma y. And we've divided it all by sine theta, so they just go. So, that's equation 18. Now here's the trick. This, this is a dirty, dirty, dirty trick. If we multiply the left-hand sides by, together, and multiply, then they must equal the mul multiply the right-hand sides together. If we multiply those two, then we get tor xy squared 
tan times co cotan, tan times 1 over tan is equal to 1. Hee <laughs> hee. Good trick, eh? Multiply those two together, we've got sigma minus sigma x, sigma minus sigma y. Awesome. Right? So what we've got is we've got a quadratic, which is that we've got sigma squared minus um, sigma times sigma x plus sigma y. plus sigma x times sigma y minus tor x y squared is equal to naught. And that's a quadratic in sigma. Very convenient. This is all looking very lovely. Um, so, then collecting terms. So we can take that quadratic and we can solve it. It's a standard um, sort of quadratic. So we have sigma is equal to minus b over 2, where b is minus sigma x plus sigma y. Um, so we've got sigma x plus sigma y over 2, plus minus a half, 1 over 2a, a 0 here, that's the square root of b squared, so that's sigma x um, plus sigma y, b squared, minus 4ac minus 4 times a is 1, c is this, sigma x sigma y minus tor x y squared, all square rooted. Okay, now that is equal to, let's just do something with this, we've got sigma x squared plus sigma y squared uh, plus 2 sigma x sigma y minus 4 sigma x sigma y, so that's actually minus 2, minus tor x y squared. Now that is equal to sigma x minus sigma y squared, notice, minus tor x y squared. Uh, so, and I've got to put a 4 there. Okay, so I can rearrange this now, so I can just put a minus sign in there, bing, Eliminate those guys, and eliminate those guys. So actually I can make that a plus 4 tor xy squared. And it's all a lot simpler and easier. So that is our value uh, for the principal stresses. So we call the bigger one, whatever the bigger one was, sigma 1 and the smaller one, sigma 2, and that's just a convention for the principal stresses. Um, so we denote them to be sigma 1 and sigma 2, and those are the two values. Um, and that's a very interesting thing. Now the last thing we can do is find the values of the maximum shear stress. So I'm going to write that up there, and then we're going to um, finally do that. Uh, that'll be a bit more awkward. Um, and uh, then we'll, we'll get there, okay? Uh, and then we'll be done.
Okay, so final part of this segment. We found the principal stresses. The other thing we can do in figure 9 is find the values of the maximum values that tor can take at that angle that's 45 degrees off of those for uh, the principal stresses. Um, now, uh, the angle the principal stresses will come at is uh, cot of uh, the angle at which the um, that, that angle we had for the maximum shear, um, or for the shear stress disappearing. Yeah, sorry. The angle this will happen at is, we'll find out in a minute, and I'll come back to. Um, but first we need to find out uh, what it is. So we need to find out the angle where this happens. Let me start this again. So we found uh, the principal stresses. The other thing we need to think about are what is the angle and value of the maximum value that the shear stress can take. So we come back to equation 10 from earlier, which, which was the value for the shear stress um, on this plane. Now, if we want to find the maximum of something, we can differentiate it and find the turning points. So if we differentiate this, then we would find d tor by d theta is equal to 0 at the turning point, is equal to, um, and what we'll have, we'll have a sigma x minus sigma y sine becomes cos, so I'll have minus, and we'll get a 2 out, so I'll have minus sigma x minus sigma y times cos 2 theta. And when we differentiate this, we'll get a, a cos becomes minus sine, and we'll get a 2 out, so we'll have a minus 2 times tor xy sine 2 theta. And we set it to 0, uh, so we can ignore both these minus signs. They're going to annoy us. If we bring um, one of them over the other side, we'll have uh, 2 tor xy sine 2 theta is equal to sigma x minus sigma y cos 2 theta. Divide by tor xy and divide by cos gives us tan 2 theta is equal to sigma x minus sigma y over 2 tor xy. Um, and when I brought it over, I needed a minus sign, so I need a minus sign, so I get a minus sign there. But, um, so that's the value of the angle. And that's the negative reciprocal of the angle we found for the principal stresses. So just as a, as a reminder, um, if we go back to the principal stresses, we found them equation 14. So that's equation 23. Uh, that's for max shear. Um, and for zero shear, the principal stresses, then we had equation, that was uh, equation 14, and that was at tan 2 theta, this was the other condition, was equal to 2 tor xy divided by sigma x minus sigma y. So it's the negative reciprocal of each other, and that means it's 45 degrees, in fact, very conveniently, um, that they're separated by. Um, so 2 theta are at 90 degrees to each other, pi by uh, pi, so the, uh, the theta are at 45 degrees. Now, the other thing we can do then is we can substitute the, this value back into equation 10 and find uh, the maxima for tor. And I'm actually just going to give you the result for that. So the result is then that tor max takes a value of a half sigma x minus sigma y squared plus 4 tor xy squared, all square rooted. Now, that's the same as we had for the principal stresses for this plus, for the difference between the maximum and minimum principal stresses, or half the difference between them. So, these are very connected things, tor max and sigma 1 and sigma 2. So um, 
what we can do if we take uh, the difference between sigma 1 and sigma 2, so if we call these sigma 1 and 2, sigma 1 minus sigma 2 then would be that plus that minus that minus that. So this guy would disappear and what we just have would be uh, twice this. So we'd have sigma x minus sigma y squared plus 4 tor xy squared. That's sigma 1 minus sigma 2. So if we divided that by 2, we'd have tor max. So the maximum shear stress is a half the difference between the principal stresses, which is a very interesting result. Um, so that's uh, what we can do to rotate the principal stresses. And what we find in terms of the maximum shear stress we could find for any rotation and the, maximum pr and the principal stresses we could find, that is the ones where the shear disappears, for any given rotation. Um, and the next segment, we'll look onto a, a geometrical trick called Moore's Circle that allows us uh, to plot all this out and do all this without having to remember all these equations. Uh, but it also shows us some things quite neatly and elegantly with a bit of geometry. Uh, and the great advantage of Moore's Circle is you only need to be able to draw a circle, which almost all of us can do, if not perfectly. Uh, so I'll see you for the next segment.